Good morning, and welcome to all of you joining us with our live stream audience here at First United Methodist Church of Iowa City. This Lenten season, we have begun with a centering thought to focus ourselves in worship. As we begin the second half of our walk with Christ, John Wesley reminds us that as Methodists, we are called to give of our treasures. He writes, all the commandments of God, the Methodist keeps, and that with all their might. For their obedience is in proportion to their love, the source from whence it flows. All the talents they have received, they constantly employ according to their master's will. Whatever a Methodist does, it does it all to the glory of God. Their one invariable rule is this, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. The Methodist thinks and speaks and acts, adorning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in all things. Lastly, as a Methodist has time, they do good unto all people, unto neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies, and that in every possible kind, not only their bodies, by feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting those that are sick or in prison, but much more, they do labor to do good to their souls, as of the ability that God gives. The Methodist is willing to spend and be spent herein, even to be offered up on the sacrifice and service of their faith, so that they may all come unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let us meditate on this thought this morning with our morning prelude.
This morning, for all of you that are trying technology at home to be with us, I too get to try technology. I'm going to try and run the slides while speaking, so feel free to start the comments right now on Facebook. Will you join me at this time for our call to worship? God richly supplies us with all things to enjoy, yet we are not to store them for ourselves. Christ is the treasure for all the world, for all time. So we must share his life and death and resurrection with all. Our world needs God's gifts. We will share all of our blessings so that we may bless others. Will you join me this morning in our opening hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be? It is hymnal uh, found in the United Methodist hymnal number 399. If you'll join me in our opening prayer. Treasured Lord, let us not store up our good fortune for tomorrow. Guide us to use our blessings in the world today. Let us have faith knowing what we will use will be renewed. We offer our gifts, our talents, our very selves for your service. Amen.
Our scripture lessons this morning come from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, and Acts chapter 20, verse 35. We begin with Matthew. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. Excuse me. I apologize. Let me come back. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. From Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And from Acts chapter 20, verse 35. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work we must support the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus. For he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Thank you, God, for this gift of scripture. Wow, what a week it has been. The world is beginning to shut down in so many different ways as we have been told to stay home and stay away from other folks. They call it social distancing, but it's actually physical distancing. We're still trying to stay heart to heart, still trying to stay connected, still trying to stay social in the midst of it all. I found this beautiful reading this week written by Laura Kelly Fensui of Mother Spirit. When this is all over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, a Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, a school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be. We were called to be, we hope to be, and may we stay that way better for each other because of the worst. As I think about our sermon series, as we have been talking about five spiritual practices that would help us become better, would become what God calls us to be, my wife and I put together a lattice because I've been talking about lattices. And here at the altar, we place this little lattice for you as you think about the imagery of, of growing, growing into what God calls you to be, growing into what God wants you to be. We begin with worship and prayer down at the bottom as we think about that kind of spirit of prayer. And, and we said, take five, take five times a day to pray. Take five times a day to pray. Pray in the morning when you get up and just give thanks to God for the gift of life, for the gift of the day. And then at breakfast, at lunch, at supper, stop. Give thanks. Give thanks to God for the gift of life and give thanks to God for the gift that is before you and the ability to have that which is in front of you. At the end of the day, before you go to bed, say one more time, thank you, God. I'm going to ask you now 
that you would join with us as a congregation, everyone, everywhere, if you would just take out those electronic devices that you have, and, and I actually brought mine with me today, uh, to bring your cell phone and uh, to actually at 6 o'clock on your phone to put a little message to yourself that all of us would add to these five times a day of prayer, a 6 o'clock prayer. And that as a congregation, we would all pray together. Anyone listening today on live stream, go ahead and do this. Or if you don't have one of these electronic devices, I already put it on my phone at 6 o'clock that every single day it would give me a reminder that I would pray at 6 o'clock. And I want you to pray for the following things. Give thanks, first of all, for the gift of life. But then pray for these three things. Pray, number one, for all those who are affected by COVID-19, the coronavirus. Pray for them. And number two, pray for all those who are helping them. The doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, everyone that is seeking to help them. Pray God's grace to be with them and strength to the, be with them as they care for those who are ill. Pray for God's healing blessings to be with those who are ill. And, and third, pray for the scientists. Pray for all those who are working for quicker testing, that are working for solutions and possible ways to shorten this disease in people to help them heal. Pray for all of them. And then at the end, after you've said those three prayers of petition for those needs in our community today and in our world today, say one more time, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the gift of life. Go ahead and put that in your phone. If you don't have one of these funny electronic devices, the rest of you can put a post-it note wherever you need to to remember, or you can write it on your calendar, but whatever. Let's all join together at 6 o'clock every single day, and let's pray. Remember, the first foundation of a life in God that helps us grow is a life of worship, a life of prayer. When we move up to the next one, we see study, listening up to God and listening to God. Now, I know that uh, some of you are reading your Bible and you're studying it, but I'd encourage you to pick your five favorite scriptures to think about those. For me, I already picked one from the psalm, Psalm 63. New every morning I wake and I think about God's great love in the morning. And just that's one for me. And I've been studying it and thinking about it. And, and Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 4 through 9 is this beautiful one, trusting in the Lord. A couple for me. And then Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, as we think about rejoicing in the Lord. Those are three for me, and I've, I've left the other two open because I'm still thinking about what might be my actual favorites. But you might want to take time to think about what your favorite scriptures are. Copy them down on a, on a notepad, on a three-by-five card. Just take them and use them and, 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 and study them and pray them and be in the presence of God. Listen to what God might be saying to you in those scriptures. The next week we talked about service and kindness. And last week I really seriously encouraged you all to be in a spirit of care, a spirit of, of compassion as you checked on your neighbors, as your family and your friends, as, as you made phone calls, as you, you sought to be heart to heart, even though we are distanced from each other. We're a dispersed church now, but we're still connected in Christ, connected in our hearts to each other and to God. And so let's find social media ways to reach out to each other. Maybe it's Skype or FaceTime or maybe it's texting. Or, In fact, I've been doing that with my kids, texting them regularly to see how they're doing, checking on them. I encourage you to do that with your neighbors, your family, your friends. Be acts of kindness. And then I'd ask for some volunteers. I'd ask anybody who is listening today to email me at btridle at firstchurch.com. If you would like to be a part of a team, we're going to take our membership of the church and we're going to divide it into little sections and we're going to pass it out to each of those persons who volunteer to make regular checks. It's kind of like shepherding the flock, sharing that load with everybody in the church that we might organize ourselves, that we might actually call 
and check each week on people. I, I call them pace setters, something I learned many years ago, that you would be praying for them, that you'd make yourself available to them by phone, and that you would call them once a week, and that you'd continue to live an example of the Christian faith in all that you do and say. Pace setters, the pace setters of kindness, pace, ser pace setters of service. Today, we're turning to this gifts of the heart. Gifts of the heart. Pray with me, please. Lord God, as we think about the scriptures today and we think about our life today in the midst of this world in which we live in, this coronavirus world, we pray, Lord, that you would send the power of your Holy Spirit upon each of us wherever we might be gathered today, that you would touch our hearts, touch our minds, and you would bless us with insights, insights that we might grow deeper in our love for you and be able to go farther in our service for you. O oh, holy God, touch our lives. In Christ we humbly pray. Amen. Our first scripture that we heard read has this little phrase in it. It's a simple little phrase. Where our treasure is, there is our heart. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As we think about that phrase, John Wesley used to ask everybody who was in a class meeting of those first Methodists when they got together, he would look at them and he would ask them this tough question, how is it with your soul? Now, I've been studying the concept of soul, which is more of a Greek concept, and I'm thinking about the word heart, which is used in the Scripture for oh, a lot, at least a thousand times in the Scripture. It's used in a variety of ways as you think about the heart. And think about it as a contrite heart, a broken heart, a heart of love, a heart of grace, and then you start to wonder what exactly is this text that says where our treasure is, is our heart. So I have to ask all of you this question, how is it with your heart? Now we can go to the doctor, and I have done this myself, and I can go to the doctor and I can get a snapshot of my heart. Okay, that's an echocardiogram or a CT scan or some other kind of scan that they might do. And it will tell you some things about your heart. Whether you have a little problem here or there or AFib or if you have a potential for a stroke or anything that might be able to tell you about your physical heart. But the question I'm asking you is not about your physical heart. It's about the seat of who you are, the essence of who you are, the heart of the matter, the center of the matter. How is it with your center? How is it with your heart? How is it with your life? When I think about that question and I ponder it myself, when I think about the world today, I, I might say something like, it's tired, it's worn out, it's scared, it's afraid. And you might say the same things. And hopefully you heard the song that Mary Jane sang for us about God and our relationship with God and how our life is truly in God's hands. How do you trust in tumult times like they are today? How is it with your heart? I think something is happening in the world today. I, I, I know that many of you read things on the line and, and many of you study things, but there's a reading that was written by Brother Richard Hendrick of Ireland. It was posted on March 21st. Yes, there is fear. Yes, there is isolation. Yes, there is panic buying. Yes, there is sickness. Yes, there is even death, but they say that in Wuhan, after so many years of noise, they can hear the birds again. They say that just after a few weeks of quiet, the sky is no longer thick with fumes. 
but blue and gray and clear. They say that in the streets of Assisi, people are singing to each other across empty squares, keeping their windows open so that those who are alone may hear the sounds of family around them. They say that in a hotel in west of Ireland, it's offering free meals and delivery to the housebound. Today, a young woman I know is busy spreading fires with her number throughout the neighborhood so that the elders may have someone to call upon. Today, churches, synagogues, mosques, temples are all preparing to welcome and shelter the homeless, the sick, the weary. All over the world, people are showing, slowing down and reflecting. All over the world, people are looking at their neighbors in a new way. All over the world, people are waking up to a new reality, to how big we really are, how little control we really have, to what really matters, to love. So we pray and remember that, yes, there is fear, but there does not have to be hate. Yes, there is isolation, but there does not need to be loneliness. Yes, there is panic buying, but there does not have to be meanness. Yes, there is sickness, but there does not have to be disease of the soul. Yes, there is even death, but there can always be rebirth of love. Wake to the choices you make to how you live now. Today, breathe. Listen behind the factory noises of your panic. The birds are singing again. The sky is clearing. Spring is coming. And we always encompassed by love. Open the windows of your soul. And though you may not be able to touch across the empty square, sing, sing, sing. I think something is happening in our world in the midst of this crisis that is affecting the heart of who we are as people. We are remembering. We are remembering who we are. We are remembering that God loves us and that God cares deeply for each and every one of us and we want to care for each other in the midst of this crisis. We are remembering what is important, relationships, family, friends, co-workers. We are remembering the power of grace and the power of forgiveness to overcome all our brokenness. We are remembering our true heart. A professor of mine back in seminary, he taught me about religious affections. His name is Don Selliers, and he wrote a book entitled The Soul in Paraphrase. The concept of affection, which, by the way, is this, this part of our heart focused outward and living in the world, designates a basic attunement which lies at the heart of one's person's way of being and acting. I think our hearts are recovering in the midst of the deepest fears we might have. We are reclaiming our heart. If you haven't felt this yet, I encourage you to reclaim your heart, to reclaim that which is essential to you, the heart of who you are, the essence of who you are, to take a snapshot of your life. No, not just to take a selfie, but take a selfie of your soul. Take a selfie of your heart. And as John Wesley asks you, how is it with your soul? you may have an answer that it is well with your soul. Not because it is well in the world, not because there's nothing that we are facing that is difficult, but because of God's love and grace that is available to us in Jesus Christ.
God was generous to us, over abundantly generous as God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world for each and every one of us. God was generous to us in loving us, in caring for us, in giving us meaning and purpose, in giving us life to its fullest. God was generous to us. God is generous to us in grace and forgiveness and wholeness and love and healing and all kinds of possibilities. And God calls us to reclaim the heart of who we are in Jesus Christ and then to be generous ourselves. Three key things about our own generosities. Number one, to be a person who cares about others by first of all thanking God for the gift of this life. You see, generosity begins with an attitude of gratitude. George Dane, one of our life, lifelong members of this church who is gone now, wrote for our newsletter a piece many years ago about stewardship and about giving. He wrote these thoughts. The church does many things for me. It gives me fellowship and togetherness. It gives me memories and renewal of spirit. It gives me hope and faith for facing an unknown future. It helps dispel loneliness and isolation. It teaches me lessons from the past and rules for living. It has taught me to share and to give and help me to overcome my inborn instinct to keep for myself what I get. Marjorie, his wife, and George, they say, I have been encouraged and supported by others around me. We are comforted in times of stress and sorrow. It has nurtured our children in love. It has given them guidance for the world filled with temptations and danger. I began to give and to share in gratitude what I had received and for what is given to me. I was thankful and wanted to, my giving and sharing to be an expression of my appreciation. The reward for giving comes this way. It comes to the form of increased self-respect and esteem. There's fulfillment of giving without any expectation of personal reward or gain. There is joy in the good feeling that comes from being needed by others and responding to that need. God's reward for helping God and God's work is that joy in our hearts. To this end, I have attempted to be a doer of the word as well as a hearer. I have attempted to be liberal in everything I have. For a long time, I thought the words fundraising and stewardship were synonymous. Stewardship is much broader. It was a commitment, a commitment to myself, to others, to the world, and it defines who I am. Part of this commitment is to make my giving a priority. I try to make my gift first off the top and from my abundance rather than what is left over. Having done that, I find I am more careful in how I use and spend the remainder. Generosity, spelled out by one of our lifelong members, is a pattern of giving from the heart to help others. And that's what we are called to do in these times. In these times of difficulty, we are called to put a priority on helping others. Our church has been joined together with the other Methodist churches here in town to make quarantine kits. And I have seen our church begin to give. One person called me and said, what do they need? And I knew they needed some playing cards for each of the kits. And so that person said, order some of those on Amazon and have them delivered so they have enough. We ordered 48 sets of playing cards. I've seen others in our church with spirit of generosity bring books and bring toys and bring puzzles for the kits. Generosity of the heart. This week, we are in charge of free lunch program, and we have a difficulty because they've closed the kitchen. And so, therefore, we've been negotiating to do this as sack lunches because those who are homeless and those who are hungry still need food. Even though they can't congregate together as a whole, they can be given a meal to take and go. 
our church is going to manage to do that. And I think we found a way to help free lunch do it for many, many days. If you want to be a part of that generous spirit of those who have been helping out, getting ready for that on Tuesday, and to help free lunch, you know you can give to the church to make that happen. UMCOR Sunday happens to be today, and usually we get a nice, nice offering for that in our church because we believe that the church needs to be in the front lines of natural disasters, in the middle of refugees, in the middle of all the problems of the world, and this empowers them to do it. Generosity of the heart. Unfortunately, the crop walk has been canceled because we are doing social distancing, but the need still exists for food at our pantries, food and also help with church world service work in the world. There are so many ways to be generous. I have asked you to pray five times a day. I have asked you to think of your five favorite scriptures and to meditate on them. I've asked you to do five acts of kindness each week. I've asked you to join in a team. And I ask you now, at least do five acts of generosity in a month. Find a way to be generous from your soul and from your heart to make a difference in the lives of others. These are the ways in which we as Christians reclaim our heart and reclaim who we are and bind ourselves with God and walk with God in this hurting and broken world. It's what we do as Christians. May we reclaim it. May we live it. And in all of my correspondence, I say to people these three simple things. Please be safe, be well, and continue to be the love of God for all. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. We're going to put on the screen our uh, Tithely app for you to know about. Um, it's different today because no one's in the sanctuary but a few of us that are doing worship. And it's different in the life of the church about finances. Uh, the Tithely app will help you do that. You can do the Umcore offering. You can do other things through it. You can give regularly to the church through it. You can also call the office and talk to Hillary at some point this week and and you can do online giving in other ways. And you can always mail it in. We still get the mail. The point isn't that we need it. It's the point is that we all need to be generous. And so I invite you to consider the ways in which you can be generous. Ways in which you can share the love of God with others. From your heart to their heart. Let's listen to this special music today and meditate on what we might be able to do. Let us prepare our hearts to be generous for the Lord. Amen.
Let's take a few moments and let's be in a spirit of prayer as we come to the Lord confessing, confessing that we are who we are. And that often means we are filled with fear and brokenness and we've made mistakes and we haven't been what God calls us to be. But God still beckons us and calls us to new life. Hear this confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to take just a moment to be in prayer in silence, to reflect upon God's love and grace, to say your petitions to the Lord. I'm going to pray for the three things I asked you to pray for earlier, for all those who are affected by COVID-19, for all those who are helping them, and for those who are looking for better testing and a cure. Let us be in prayer. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory be to God. Amen. Now let me once again offer to you the sign of peace that we've been practicing in the life of our church. We come together, peace be with you, and also with you. One more time, peace be with you. May peace truly be with you. Let's sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is, uh, it's on the screen, I hope, for you, so you can watch the words. I want to walk as a child of the light.
would like to say a word of thank you to Gay Young on the organ and Mary Jane, who sang and played for us today, and to Jason, who was our liturgist, and to JP up in the sound booth, who makes this all happen for you, our audience, our live stream audience. Also, Charles, who makes sure the building's in good order, and also Adam Hamilton, who inspired us as he preached the walk. Thank you for being with us today. My hope and my prayer is that the love of God would surround you. The love of God would lift you up. The love of God would protect you. The love of God would encompass you and hold you with grace and empower you to be generous of heart. Generous of heart for those who are hurting in our world. Bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.